Okay, so hello everyone. Wel welcome to this first session of the mobility training module organized by MedCities. Uh, as you know, this is part of the uh, four thematic modules that, that we are organizing, which consists on three online sessions and afterwards a mentoring section, uh, which I will explain you on the third se session. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our Secretary General, Mr. Josep Canals. Uh, Mr. Josep, he, he is a, a biologist and an urban planner. So, well, I would also like to thank you all for being here. And Josep, if you want to do the welcoming. Okay, hello, bon dia, good afternoon. Masal uh, here, buenas tardes, bonjour. Uh, thank you very much for being here to this uh, the final group of, of uh, thematic sessions um, that uh, you might know and I like also to highlight uh, always that uh, this is this cycle of capacity of training sessions is the result is the response of the general secretariat of mid cities to a necessity, to a request of the mayors, of your mayors, of the mayors of the 63 municipalities that uh, encompass uh, mid cities. So um, uh, for us, is is uh, is the first time that the general secretary is is providing uh, to the whole universe of of our members uh, capacity training session uh, cycle. So for us, is a is a great event and is a, a, a reason to be satisfied and hopefully uh, for you too. I would like to thank you for being here, for being interested in, in improving your skills, in uh, um, knowing what's happening uh, on, on other places uh, around the, our Mediterranean uh, region. Um, as you may know, we, have, we this is the fourth one we have uh, seen uh, uh, sessions uh, upon uh, environmental management, uh, energy efficiency, uh, waste management. And today we start with uh, sustainable mobility, uh, which uh, are the experts of Bubble are providing to us. So thank you too. Uh, so uh, just to, to thank you for, for being here. And uh, um, in spite of being at the last session and having uh, the previous one, the, the energy efficiency, right, uh, Gemma, which is uh, still um, in, de in development. We had uh, yes. just uh, witnessed the first session on uh, Tuesday. Please uh, don't hesitate to spread the word to other member sessions. We were expecting even more uh, attendees from our members. Uh, today I sent a letter to, to the mayors to, be, to them to be aware of this. So please don't hesitate to, to tell uh, any neighbor city that you may know among, among uh, our, uh, our associations to let them know that we are uh, conducting this uh, cycle of sessions, very interesting sessions, I think. Uh, and uh, the results and the reactions of the attendees uh, say it so. So please uh, be, uh, feel free to, to learn, to, to hear, and I, and I hope uh, and I expect that these sessions will be very, very, very fruitful to you. Thank you very much and uh, have a, a good day. And thanks to you, Gemma, also for all this work. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah, so Miguel, if you, whenever you want to start. Just a last reminder that there is a translation available in English and also, I sorry, in French and also in Arabic. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gemma, and also Giuseppe for this uh, great um, uh, introduction. Um, so, um, Without further ado, we'd like to, to start our session. We have about uh, two hours now with you. We are very thrilled uh, to be here in this amazing group of professionals of Mediterranean um, cities. Um, we have a lovely um, agenda um, uh, for today to um, fill um, the next two hours, first of all, 
um, maybe what I would like uh, you all to um, be aware of. There is a chat um, in um, uh, in the tool in, that you can use at any time. Um, I would ask you to post questions that you have there um, in any language that you feel uh, suitable. Um, and uh, I will then at some point stop and answer the question um, to not, you know, uh, stop mid-sentence. So please uh, post your questions in the chat and we'll at the end have a rather a long session for a prolonged Q&A as well. Um, before we hop into the agenda, allow me to quickly introduce myself and my colleague Miguel um, here. Um, so um, I myself, um, Alexander Schmidt, Alex um, uh, from Babel of CEO and founder. Um, I'm professional transport engineer. Um, in the last 10 years worked in uh, urban mobility and mobility projects all across Europe and actually Asia and America too. Um, and I've also been training smart cities and urban mobility sessions for the last seven years. We are so, so we are not only training in the capacity here as part of Mad Cities, but we are basically providing training on a monthly basis all over Europe in the topics of smart cities, smart mobility, smart energy, and smart urban spaces. Um, and um, I would then quickly hand over, so I'll do uh, lots of the talking um, today, but also my great colleague Miguel um, um, will um, do two chapters of today's session, so I'll um, leave him to introduce himself. Thank you, Alex. Uh, it's also a pleasure for me to be here with you today. Um, quickly introducing myself. Uh, myself, I'm an energy engineer uh, with the specific of, of uh, smart cities uh, with, a, with a good background of the Euro European Institute of Innovation and Technology for energy and for urban mobility. So be, uh, supporting you today on understanding the challenges and the requirements of the urban mobility in the Mediterranean areas. Coming back to you. Thanks a lot, Miguel. Um, the first thing we actually want to do with you is start with a small, uh, let's say, I don't mm -hmm. won't call it an exercise, but rather a collection um, of uh, your interests and needs. So we will um, be um, having now two hours um, together, and it's basically my and Miguel's job um, to um, fill, as Josep said at the beginning, a knowledge gap, to give you some insights on the practical work we have been doing throughout uh, Europe and the globe. Um, but in any of the slides that we have prepared, I can set a specific focus uh, uh, based on your um, particular interests. So um, that is why we would like now to um, uh, collect in a small mural um, the expectations you have on this training or what you are particularly interested um, uh, in. So my colleague um, Miguel um, will... Uh, now share a link in the chat that you can uh, click on um, and then you will enter this very simple online whiteboard um, that is um, basically um, has some sticky notes on it that's the yellow ones um, uh, in uh, in here very good Gemma is already uh, in there um, so by double clicking on one of the uh, sticky notes you can open them and then you can write down your particular interest, what you are specifically interested in the area of urban mobility. Um, and I will um, read them out continuously as well and um, try to focus some of my nuances of my more practical insights in the next uh, two hours on those uh, elements. So um, please feel free now to, uh, to jump in. Um, the uh, animal names that you get assigned are random. So don't worry why you are visiting Hippotalamus, um, Laila. That's uh, just the system gives that um, uh, automatically. So there are um, these animal names assigned to you. So please feel free on clicking on the existing uh, ones. Also, if you click on an empty space with a double click, um, that will uh, open a new one as well, but um, feel free to use those that are already available. Miguel will also start a timer now so that you can see how long we still do in this, um, uh, in this exercise. You'll see the timer running um, on uh, top. So we'll take three minutes um, for you to fill this. 
Um, please also for those of you that feel like, yeah, it's not worth contributing this one, we're gonna do a second exercise um, later in, um, in the session where we're gonna use the same tool. And it will be very good for you if you already have the experience now, if everything works um, so that we can do the second session um, then more efficiently because the second session um, of today's workshop prepares the next sessions. So for next week and the week after, we will be collecting your challenges. We will be focusing um, that so that we can focus on your um, city's challenges over the next two weeks as well. So thanks, I think that's going super well. So I will start um, reading some out um, here. So we have um, uh, one uh, to uh, understand uh, smart parking. That is very good. We will have an example about smart parking in uh, lots of detail um, at, in the fifth uh, part of our uh, presentation um, today. Um, we have uh, here the one um, that I can see in large, know more about soft mobility. Um, soft mobility, another term for active mobility, so walking and cycling. We'll touch upon this. We have quite some examples also and analysis for bike and bike sharing um, uh, systems. There is a particular one on safety and security for bike users and pedestrians. We don't have specific slides on this, but we'll make some um, um, notes um, and some comments uh, throughout the session um, on this that directly leads also into the next comment on low carbon mobility, um, which we will um, automatically be talking um, about. Then we have a comment on smart and sustainable data collection systems. We have a great example from an Italian um, a city there, and I have um, added uh, some a slide here as well on the five large different data sourcing systems that are available to any city globally. So we will be talking about that one too. Um, then there is a comment on the SUMPs. So who has never heard the topic of SUMPs? S-U-M-P, Sustainable Urban Mobility Plans. It's, um, it's a standardized, um, uh, let's say, planning methodology for um, sustainable urban mobility. And we're going to talk about this throughout the session rather extensively um, and also share some uh, practical results and political commitment will be a part of these elements too. We don't have much on pedestrianization. We can uh, add this maybe in some of the um, later sessions. We'll focus today because of the time a little more on, on, on bicycles um, uh, as the other part of, um, uh, but we can, uh, we will uh, touch upon this and we will uh, focus more on this um, in the next sessions. I can do at the end some anecdotes also on smart traffic lighting. Um, we don't have examples for this prepared, but we have been uh, involved in the lots of the different ones um, throughout the last years. So that is, so to say what I can see here, um, no more about soft mobility, environmental conscious transport modes, yes. So I think there is a lots of good things. And the co good thing for, for me to see here is that actually what we prepared fits a lot to what you're expecting to do uh, and to hear. Um, so that's what we will um, be looking uh, into over the next two hours. And the things that we don't have at the core of this presentation, we'll see if we can uh, fill it into one of the later ones. So without further ado, let's have a quick um, look into the agenda. Um, and thanks a lot for this active participation already at the beginning. And I'll try to put my anecdotes, my uh, focus of the slides on the topics that you mentioned. So we'll have six um, elements that we're going to go through, six parts of our agenda. The first one focuses on challenges and requirements of urban mobility systems. So why do we actually have to uh, change things? Why do we actually have to get active in that area? Um, the next one is about the role of urban mobility and the planning aspect in particular on the urban quality of life, uh, which my colleague Miguel will be doing. Then we will, as I said, then we go into the second, and that's now more of an exercise or an activity, um, talking about the challenges in your cities. We will 
collect them. We will uh, prioritize them also um, for the um, next sessions. And then we will, um, as I explained already, talk about sustainable urban mobility plans, so SUMPs, in uh, more detail. And then we'll share some good practices um, about, um, about several areas of urban mobility. And then the last point, and I think that is the core part of which you should take away of our presentation today, we'll talk about long-term urban mobility strategies, the importance really of planning. And planning, not just in creating ideas, but having a proper analysis, knowing what to go for having a strategy and then a roadmap to implementation. So that's what we're going to do um, uh, today and in the next uh, close to uh, two hours. So I think one of the um, most important um, uh, things to understand is um, as a transport engineer and as you know, as you are also um, uh, working in cities, change is a constant element of our work. So our cities have continuously changed over the last thousands of years. It has been accelerating a lot over the last um, uh, uh, hundred years. And, um, and so this change and these, uh, these new elements that come into this, this is nothing new. What is new really is the speed. So originally um, cities were designed to, to tackle and to work on um, um, challenges of, of infrastructure provision, which had a, a life cycle of 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And now we are working on technological, environmental challenges, where the technology is moving and uh, is, is being renewed in a yearly basis, on a bi-yearly basis. So this is um, why it's so important to understand that it's, it's still the same issues, but the speed of change is much quicker. And there are some elements in this uh, change um, that you know are new and our challenges are um, really um, uh, moving uh, forward quickly, and there are new challenges um, coming along. You know the climate crisis. I think all of the countries that are here in this um, in this webinar have signed the Paris Climate Accords, the climate agreement, where your national government signed off to reducing um, uh, CO2. Um, emissions, then a lot of the um, cities that you live in will start spreading into the countryside. You have, there's a high quality of life inside um, your cities. And so people are trying to get there, are trying to live there, are trying to make a living, improving themselves. And this is something that's been happening a lot. And this is, as my professor at Imperial College always says to say, we as transport engineers have the um, requirement to you know, help people achieve what they want. We are a derived need. So we as mobility engineers, we just are there to fulfill the needs and the requirements of the people based on the decisions, where they wanna live, what they wanna do. So these are just facts we have to work with. Climate change is the next one being um, uh, more specific when it comes to um, also um, the, um, urban mobility sector, um, because um, the, um, the urban mobility sector, for example, in Europe, we are trying within the next decades to basically decarbonize um, uh, urban transport already. So mobility always being the first one, the earliest one, the quickest one to be transitioned into a zero carbon or low carbon um, future. And there are challenges that you also already know, congestion um, that might be cars that can also be pedestrians that can be bikes you know there are cities across the world where where there's bike congestions there's scooter congestion so this is all possible but we are handling basically infrastructure that's restricted uh in the, its capacity and now we have a very new one which changed rather a lot in recent years because we had these ideas as engineers that mass transit mass transport can solve a lot of our problems I think um, we all remember the pictures where there are like the 20 cars on the on the midst of a road and all these people easily fit into a bus. You know, that used to be a very desirable scenario up until a year ago where we just say, okay, we use less public space and put the people closer together in public transportation. This has changed this kind of thinking 
um, because of the social distancing has changed significantly over the last year. So we are again, and that is the whole part of this first session, we are again in a in a world where we have to innovate, where we have to change the way we think. So we cannot put just more people into less space because there are security concerns. So we have to find a new way again on tackling these issues. And this will always be the way. So one of the things that we all need to understand as professionals is that there is a continuous drive, a continuous need for us to innovate, to change the urban systems, to change the mobility systems. So that is a little bit of an introduction to, um, to um, the need to constantly innovate. And that brings us later also to the need to plan, to analyze in detail what we want to do. And now talking actually about a little more detail, what are the challenges and requirements, particularly um, in Mediterranean cities. Um, Okay, 15 seconds. Okay, so there's a, um, um, so the first one, the first section, so we're gonna talk about some structure um, of challenges and requirements um, that there are. The first one, um, health and environment. Um, and you know, the structure we are using is one that's very common in the Mediterranean, but you will see uh, lots of other structures of how these challenges and requirements are being, um, uh, are being, you know, combined or clustered in the end it all comes down to the same things but in your city um, in parts of your city some might be more important than others and then we will see what are actually um, the solutions um, for this so one um, of the um, major um, quality um, or health and environmental issues is air quality for those of you that are based in the european Union, um, there is going to be a, a law uh, coming into place or that's biting um, soon where cities will have to reduce air, the air pollution and improve air quality or they face fines by the European um, Commission. There are several uh, national uh, areas uh, across the Mediterranean that are thinking about um, something similar. Um, uh, air quality, not always the same kind of thing. So for those of you in the more uh, in the Northern African region, of course, you have always high amounts of particulate matter because of uh, also sand um, and of the um, of the salt from the um, from the sea. For those of you a little further away from the sea, the particulate matter more often is always a harmful thing from cars, from tires, from these kinds of things. Then we have noise pollution as another um, a major concern. Um, one of the um, uh, things that has been happening all across the globe is that in addition to normal mobility planning, there are noise pollution plans being um, uh, being uh, done. One of the you know few things that technology there is doing as well as with electric cars, electric vehicles, especially electric motorcycles, um, the uh, noise pollution of traffic can be reduced rather a lot. Then we have the next one, heat islands. Um, and that's particularly important the further south you go in the Mediterranean. Uh, if there is not enough green or blue space, so not enough um, living um, uh, plants, not enough blue, uh, so water in the inner cities that uh, the places heat up rather quickly, that is depending a lot on your positioning and on the built environment, but is particularly important for mobility because the hotter it is, the less people will like to uh, use active or soft mobility. Then um, the problem of, let's say, an ever fattening or a growing population when it comes to um, uh, tiredness. So people do not like to walk that, that much anymore. There is people that prefer the non-active uh, mode. So there's also a cultural um, issue in the health and environment things. Then we have road safety, something that was um, mentioned um, earlier in the in the slides already. So how can we keep pedestrians and um, and um, cyclists uh, safe? There are great trials all across the world on the zero accident uh, cities, and now we have mentioned that already with the pandemic, also the threat of being infected 
in, pub in transport during uh, walking around. So let's move then to the next and we will go through some of these um, elements now a little more quickly um, when it comes to, um, to the different challenge areas um, that we have. Of the ecological ones, we have also already mentioned climate neutrality. Again, there is now the first binding commitment from all of the nations that are involved here to really reduce the carbon footprint to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and mobility will always be one of the first ones to be looked into and that goes then also from the uh, on the other side not just you know putting le less emissions out but also taking more emissions binding more carbon with like bio cities using nat nature-based solutions within cities then as a third element as a third area of challenges and uh, requirement is a social one social equity um, as well, that we had um, uh, World uh, uh, Women Day last um, last month, where also another point was um, was put on um, on how safe do females, uh, women, um, young uh, women feel in public spaces, in parks, at night. So let's um, uh, that's safety concern that always has to do with public spaces, and therefore how we move and uh, and act and that then also has to do with uh, what kind of people um, uh, can feel safe in those areas so let's move further to uh, the next one and that as this was a an important one um, that was mentioned as well let me spend some time as well um, it's uh, about uh, governance um, uh, of uh, urban mobility um, we will have some examples later of good governance and how some solutions are being used to also uh, influence how people use and manage public uh, transport. Citizen engagement and empowerment is there a very important term. Let me just put a note on this because um, no one expects anyone or uh, you guys to have cit citizens join the whole process um, from, you know, ideation to implementation of smart mobility projects. It's rather um, have them at, at an, at a, in the design stage, have them um, somewhere it, where you have different options to be discussed and then uh, involve them also in the pilot testing. So it's the, these kinds of elements are often, you know, overthought um, uh, as a, you know, process designer that you might be in your city, have a look into that where it makes sense at which stage um, uh, to bring them in. Then we have new um, opportunities and we have bicycle examples on these then too, that we can combine uh, public and private initiatives, especially uh, with bicycles, with uh, scooters and these kinds uh, of things and um, create new and better services. And with uh, the particular you know, place that urban mobility is being done in the public space, you as a municipality and the local governments do have a uh, lots of um, power over how urban mobility is being um, uh, done. And we will talk, as I said already earlier in chapter five, I think, uh, in much more detail about sustainable urban mobility planning. Then there is also um, economic challenges and requirements that are coming. And I'll like to make a note on this with especially el electrification of, um, of vehicles all across the world. This technology is much simpler. So I've seen a lots of local economies actually investing in companies locally producing electric vehicles, electric bicycles, electric bikes, um, and also small electric uh, vehicles. I've seen that in India. I've seen that in uh, South, um, uh, South America. So through the simplification of those technologies, um, there can also be actually new economies that were maybe out of sight and were rather focused in uh, other parts um, uh, of the world like Germany. So I'm sitting here in Stuttgart, basically where the um, uh, car was born. So these things are now much more democratic and much more dispersed um, across. And then in general, mobility also has this thing, the more people move, the uh, more active the economy is. So as a mobility strategist, we have the task also to keep the economy moving. And with these new technologies coming into um, these sectors. We'll talk about the different kind of um, um, data streams that are available to us now for planning um, mobility systems. 
We, there also come new requirements on our tools. So big data is this great term. So lots of high velocity, high volume um, uh, data with a large variety that we can put together to make better decisions. And that all comes along now with digital tools, data streams um, that are available to us. Um, so that um, on um, the challenges and requirements and so to say next steps that are coming along in our, um, in our work as transport professionals, as city employees, um, you will see many other, um, let's say, structures of this, but they always come down to, let's say, these six different headlines, even though they don't name them exactly. So just for you to get an overview, okay, these are the things we are working with, these are the things we are trying to tackle. These are the challenges really that we are there to solve. And I'll now hand over to my colleague, Miguel, um, uh, for the next part. Thank you, Alex, and, and well said, because these are indeed the challenges that uh, are in the overarching world, not only on the Mediterranean areas, but it's transverse and work everywhere. Now on the screen, you will to see a very nice picture taken from the sustainable mobility handbook for the MED area because it really translates on the role of actually mobility has on transporting and the urban quality of life because we talked about a lot of very let's say open questions and challenges that we have to tackle however we have to go a bit more precise and in depth in the, the, the role and in the environment that we are looking at so we would start talking a bit about the urban ecosystem uh, of Mediterranean city. So as you know, because you are indeed from Mediterranean city, you know that these, these type of, of cities are, are one of the ones with more history. So their urban structure, in the one hand, it's very, it's, it was not built in the last 50 years. So it's old and most of them has have a lot of high heritage. So meaning that there are narrow streets, the streets were not built for cars, they were built before cars. So the spatial planning, it's not made for this type of, of transportation. So it it's generates some challenges when you come to, to plan and to move forward with these solutions. On the second point, uh, as mentioned, so there's a high, a very rich cultural heritage. There's a long history uh, has been around most of the cities for millennia and uh, architectural landscapes cannot be changed. Things cannot be just changed, muted as in, in newer cities or planned um, uh, as like in 20, 30 years ago because things were made long before of that. Uh, and last but not least, all of the cities are in the same area uh, of the world. So in the same latitude, made them very making them with the same ecosystem so the same humidity the same temperature the same conditions for uh, the living beings and therefore for the cities so this can be very affected so you you know with the climate change with the climate crisis they are highly affected by with increase of temperature so every city in the end is very different however uh, there are a lot in common especially by the geographical area so if you move a bit forward you will see that each in the urban structure, as I mentioned, it was not made for high intense traffic. And it's it's the urban shape is much older than the newer cities that we see nowadays in, in other countries. Also, we have to take into consideration that due to cultural and um, touristic heritage and uh, sorry, and historical heritage, um, tourism is a very important factor and this generates volatility in the population numbers. Thereby, it's not that the population is the same every year. We have to predict for special times that we're going to have more people coming into the city and these more people using transport. Um, we're going to provide some examples in a few slides. Um, and last but not least, we have to understand that the, the transport is key to providing sustainability and to tackle the climate crisis. Transport is one of the, the, highest, um, the highest providers of CO2 emissions, and thereby we have to take this into consideration for a more sustainable and better future for our cities. Then we're gonna talk about a bit more about why, how we can be more inclusive and why can commuting actually be inclusive? I know that some of your cities do not have the same public transport, public transport system. It changes rather a lot. However, it's important that the community is involved when we plan this, this type of systems. Solutions that we have in our cities should be owned by the, the people. So the people have to be the first and the last 
uh, member when we are designing these solutions, because we have to consider not only spatial areas of our cities, so not only how our architectural, our planning is done in space, but also how our social um, aspect is made. I give here a very quick example of the, the, the metropolitan area of Lisbon that in 2019 they created the, the urban pass for the all 18 municipalities before they had different passes with different type of pricing including trains, metro, buses and for that they decided that they would say single price pricing also for families making it more accessible and then you can see here in the map how big is the area and I can tell you I'm from there and this is quite big and it was a very big improvement. They got more than 100% of purchases of passes decreasing uh, traffic and increasing um, also equity that people that lived very far away could pay the same price to access the center of the city as people that would live in the city center. And this was a very crucial step. That. Um, and then talking a bit about health and air quality, when you talk about the development of new technology, when you, just before we were discussing about requirements, uh, Mediterranean cities have indeed a geographical condition perfect for, act, for activity. We talk about in the north of, of Europe, in the north, they, we get like minus 10, minus 20 degrees, which in most of the Mediterranean cities we can afford not to have. So we have perfect temperature, perfect conditions. We can do walking and cycling. We can have a good road design for non-motorized vehicles. Um, for the other hand, when we talk about hair quality, uh, we can make sure that our cities are safe so we can breathe. So it's not that we are congested by the, the guests from the cars. It's important that we have alternative modes, that we have reduction of speed, electrification of fleets, or when you try to make some public transport, as I mentioned, to design it from the people and for the people, for the citizens, and not just because it's a nice solution that we would like to have. Um, I will now pass to one thing, the next exercise, uh, which is how we actually see our challenges in our cities. We talk about a lot of requirements. We talked about challenges. We talked about some ideas. Um, but now we want to hear from you. Um, I will share the link in the chat. You'll be able to, to see it. But we want to hear from you, as we mentioned, what are the, the challenges that we face at the moment in your city? What do you want to solve? The link you can find it at this very moment in the chat. Give me a second and you will be able to find it here. I'll also share my screen. The procedure is exactly the same as the one before. So you will be able to see the, um, the, the mural link. In the left, you have the challenges that you will be able for the first instance, you can write them. So we're gonna have about three to four minutes to, detail. to do this, I'll set up a timer. And once you write the challenges, we're going to have a second step, which is to prioritize our challenges. So you can find here a very easy graph, which says on the left, on the, um, on the side, it says the importance of the challenge. And then you say the difficulty of solving it. I invite you first, on the first stage, we just collect all of the ideas. So there's no bad challenge. So there's no, if it's easy or not, it doesn't matter. I invite you to write on the left side, uh, of the mural, the challenges that you face. And then on the second stage, we will do the, the prioritization. I'll set up a timer right now of three minutes so that we can start it. And I will start also, uh, Alex did in the, the case before, to start reading them out loud. Uh, the timer has been set. As mentioned first, it's just to collect our ideas and challenges. So you can start there already some pre-made ones that can give you some inspiration. I can even read them while you, you think. For example, shifting to active modes of transport, it, uh, of walking and cycling. As a second one, to avoid negative health, safety, and environment impacts of urban mobility. Um, as a third one, to improve urban logistics and focus on last mile distribution. So I'll give you now two minutes and, and 20 seconds. I'll leave you some time for you can write them. But think about what you want to tackle in your cities. This is important for us because these challenges are going to be used for us to present on the next session next week, the use cases that you can then take as an example for your cities. So for example, if you want 
to improve traffic flow management, we will present you use cases that helps to, to do this and you can see how you can do this in your cities. I can see that someone is writing um, in there. I will continue to, to read the ones that we have so far. Take your time. Uh, if, if you cannot uh, access this link, please write the, the questions and the topics in the chat and they will be taken into consideration. I see, for example, um, continuing to read, improving public transport service provision. So very important to see how we can make public transport for everyone. Um, then improve the, the quality of public space. So this is actually one of the most uh, challenges these days due to COVID-19. So how can we can give high quality public space to the people? Um, for the last that I, I already spoken about, improve the traffic flow management. So how we can use um, ITS systems to, to do that. On, and on another note, if to, to use this mural, you just have to double click on one of the yellow uh, posts to see and write it down. It should not. Um, it should work like that, and it's very simple. And if you want to drag them, you can simply click, click fixed click on them and move them around. Continuing, I see that someone wrote avoid transition bar barriers, um, encourage soft mobility in very hilly and slope environments. Very interesting indeed. How we make people use soft mobility when it's not that easy. Um, and then provide safe mobility for women. Um, so now we we get to the to the the the, the time we are finishing the, the challenges on the left side. Um, I will give you a couple of more seconds if you want to finalize your challenges. And then we can start placing them on the prioritization scale. It's funny enough that the visiting snail is the one that's already jumped to the next step. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think it's rather self-explanatory, but still, you know, finalize your, your parts, write down the challenges, take the time on this because this is going to be the important part also to, to move forward to and we'll reference to that also when talking about sustainable urban mobility plans. Okay, so, so please. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks a lot um, uh, for this, ladies and gentlemen. And now, as you have already um, started, I would like to invite you to move the ones you have written into this uh, matrix, so into this graph. I'll just very quickly um, uh, introduce the, the, what it says. So the um, vertical axis um, has the importance as the scale. So if it is uh, not very important challenge, you put it very low into the graph. If it's a very important challenge, you put it very high um, in the graph. Exactly. Um, so that's, uh, so to say, where you place it from the height. And then uh, the horizontal axis is difficulty. So you would place it um, uh, on the left if it's easy to be done, and you would place it on the right if it is very hard um, uh, to be done. So I would now invite you to, to place them there. Also, if you see the others, already uh, there. Also think about, do you think it's more important? So it goes a little higher than this. Do you think it's less important than it goes a little lower? Do you think it's easier to be tackled than you go a little to the left? Or is it harder to be tackled than you go a little bit to the right? Um, I'll look at you uh, doing this. In the meantime, I'll a little explain what this tells us um, uh, as well. So first of all, what always happens when you do an exercise like this, there is nothing in the bottom left corner, in the bottom left quadrant. Because if it was of low importance and low difficulty, it is rather not a very, it's, we wouldn't call it a challenge um, uh, even. Um, uh, so um, then there are the ones that are very difficult, uh, very easy to do. 
and the importance is, is rather high. So these are the ones which often contain the so-called quick wins. So things that we can do rather quickly and achieve the first results. And then if we talk about the sustainable urban mobility plans at a later stage, um, we will see that uh, especially the ones that are very difficult and very important are the ones that are high in the priority list, but that also take a lot of time and resources um, uh, to be tackled. So we have two more um, uh, to be put. Um, if no one takes them, uh, Miguel will try to, to put them somewhere into, um, uh, into uh, the system. Um, and um, I think uh, that gives us already a very good overview of where we are heading for the next, uh, for the next times. I'll just, you know, I'm not gonna go through them uh, one by one now because Miguel has already read some of them um, out, um, but I think um, it always is a, um, an Im important thing to just talk about some of them quickly. So there is the ones um, that have a rather low um, difficulty and uh, let's say mid importance. So the one that I would like to talk about for a few moments is avoiding transition barriers. That is also also one that we have identified why I was director at EIT Urban Mobility. Um, as one of the more complex ones, because there are several kinds of transition barriers. There is the organizational ones that we have as a as a municipality um, to actually, you know, simplify the processes for implementation. So that's the organizational barriers. Then there are regulatory barriers because as a city you don't have all the power to make all the decisions. So it, it depending on the country's um, governance, you might not have the power to change roads um, because it might be a regional or re national um, responsibility for that particular road. So there are the regulatory um, uh, barriers. Then there are technological ones. Um, we will see some of the technology examples that we have later where data are being generated and as a municipality you'd like to use those data also for many other things but you know handling high volumes of data in real time to create real time insights that's not something that you learn in a day and um and that transition takes time though there are also technological um uh, barriers then um one in that corner i don't think we'll talk about but it's general something that um uh, people are talking about in the Mediterranean is, I think, rather at the forefront and leading in this area is reducing the use of, of cars, of private cars in, um, uh, in particular. Um, then one that's in the very middle um, of, of the graph at the moment is the small streets with a lack of parking. That's something that we see all across the world in heritage cities, especially in the Mediterranean, southern um, uh, Europe, so in let's say older, um, older cities, they attract a lots of tourists and they attract a lots of um, people because they are lovely to be in. It's uh, a lots of the cities um, in central and northern Europe are trying to narrow their streets, trying to pedestrianize areas so that there is less cars going through, and that's already in the built environment in Mediterranean. Um, uh, cities, but that creates another barrier, another problem in that sense, so that cars, and especially when we talk about delivery, so if vans are trying to come in, if, you know, we are trying to stock our shops in the city center, when these things um, uh, need larger vehicles to come in, there is issues coming around that. Good thing is, with new technologies, with good governance, with good management, also these things can be tackled. So there are, for example, um, in, uh, in southern French cities, you'll see several um, removable barriers huh, that even can be, you know, removed with the click of a button so that a van can go in, but private cars stay out. So these, these are challenges, um, uh, uh, very important. And then uh, we have one on the very high difficulty and um, uh, mid importance one with the providing safety to the vulnerable. So in that case, to, to women. Um, as well, there is quite some interesting cases, especially from Asia. You might have heard about the um, uh, what Japan does, where there are specific carts in trains, but only for women. Then there is there has been a ride hauling um, service in India, specifically only for women. So there is a um, there is tests around these um, things as well, um, and um, 
and systems being uh, put in place um, if this is a challenge actually um, in, in your city. Um, I like a lot that we have on the very top left corner with, let's say, a rather low difficulty but high importance, a mobility plan, a low carbon mobility plan, because we're going to talk about this. Um, and I agree with you, it's easy to be done or it's easier to do the plan than then to implement it. So let's talk about how to write a good plan so that in the end it is also then implemented. Good. Um, then I would say um, we um, jump to one last one, which is the improving of public transport, because I think that is um, particularly um, interesting because it has changed particularly over the last uh, year with the change of um, uh, of the pandemic um, that you know mass transport and public transport has a lot has lost uh, lots of trust so that's something where lots of people are still working on on how to tackle this and I think there are some amazing uh, things also at the end that Miguel can show us uh, in the last chapter so if it's okay, I would then jump back into the presentation and thank you very, very much for this very active um, uh, participation uh, in this um, second exercise. And as, as we said, this is um, uh, where we will uh, also pick up in the next, um, in the next sessions um, uh, next week and the week um, after that. So, um, the next part that I want to jump into is actually a very brief overview of the economics and why do we plan urban mobility. So uh, often when we discuss about investments to be done into infrastructure, into um, buildings, into whatever is required for, for running our, um, our system, then um, we talk only about the planning and construction um, steps in this. But these steps are the smaller part of actually the overall cost of the infrastructure. Now it depends a lot on what kind of infrastructure um, we are talking about. So don't, don't take these figures for all kinds of infrastructure. This is basically taken from, uh, from the built environment where the majority of the cost in that case over 75% actually occur in the operational phase. Now this, this is interesting because a lot of what good planning gives us and a lot of what also new technologies give us is not a reduction in the planning and construction costs. But what this give us is rather um, a reduction in um, the um, operational costs. But that cost can be, this reduction can be so significant that, you know, um, it's definitely justifies the few um, additional um, percent of money that we have to put into the planning stages because that is going to be the initial problem that you will have is how to fund proper planning into sustainable urban mobility. Every euro you spend there will be paid back at a later stage in the operational um, phase and that is something that is particularly important to sell to the decision makers and let me be super honest with you, that is not easy. It's not easy at all um, because um, often these, pardon? Yeah. Um, it's particularly important to, to sell it to them and it's not easy at all um, because, um, um, because a lot of these benefits are also reaped only after political terms run out. So um, this is uh, important um, to have uh, for many of these plans that we are talking about, especially sustainable urban mobility plans. We say that it is important not just to have an agreement amongst the ruling um, parties or amongst those that are currently in power, maybe for the next four, five, eight years, but also with the opposition, also bringing on board the um, uh, you know, um, minorities in that um, because these terms reap benefit only on a longer, um, um, on a longer 
um, place. I'll just quickly explain the difference between the two paragraphs. The green area that you um, can see, Laya, that's the cost. So overall, the in the first uh, graphic, the green areas uh, amount to 100%. That basically said that 75% of the overall operate of the overall costs of the overall project come in the operational phase. Um, the uh, if in the uh, in the scenario where we don't or in the normal scenario, if we put more time into planning, we can cut the operational costs significantly and therefore also cut in this example that you can see here 30% of the life cycle costs by spending more time in early stage in planning and then reaping the benefits by having lower costs in the operational phase. So that's the example that I brought in here. And that's so to say also the case that we bring to decision makers when we tell them it is worth to invest in the planning because it will benefit in the overall costs, in the life cycle costs. So I hope that um, uh, answers um, uh, the question. I would then um, jump into the next uh, part. Um, where we will be talking about sustainable urban mobility plans. Um, and um, these, uh, the picture that you can see here now um, is one from one of my favorite um, uh, areas. It's in, in uh, Barcelona. Um, and um, you see here one um, sustainable urban mobility solution and, and a shared bicycle system, which we're going to talk about um, uh, later on, that has been developed by several stakeholders, public, uh, private, together with the citizens in, uh, in Barcelona. And that's considered one of the big, great success stories of, a, um, of one of these uh, schemes. So let's move um, into um, into why we actually plan uh, or why we actually make um, uh, planning for sustainable urban mobility uh, with a SUMP. So again, a SUMP is a sustainable urban mobility plan. Um, these, um, the reason we are doing this um, is to improve, to tackle the challenges that you have mentioned. Some of the ones that are most often um, uh, you know, named by, by all the people, and there are hundreds of these plans now already made, uh, is reducing pollution, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, so green, making the transport more clean, um, improving public space, um, improving the cost effectiveness and efficiency of transportation of both people and good, and then also reducing, as you said earlier, risks for especially vulnerable people, pe uh, children going to school, um, uh, women out at night to um, make them feel more safe, but then also in uh, which is with uh, and also for you guys the Mediterranean uh, very important um, uh, to be more resilient and that's another of these terms that is used in this uh, rather a lot and we'll talk about that in just a minute um, of these areas for more resilience um, uh, to you know natural disasters, financial uh, risks, and all these uh, elements. So good planning gives us um, all these benefits. Before we talk about resilience, uh, let us quickly talk about you know, the major elements of what is the core of a sustainable urban mobility plan. So now you say, OK, that is another, that is another plan, and it has completely a different structure than all the other things um that um you have been uh doing already maybe you just quickly um, put a yes or a, a thumbs up or somewhere in the chat if you have done one of the following a sustainable energy action plan a sustainable energy and climate action plan um a, a smart city plan um a digitalization plan um a green city plan um, a resilient city plan, an active mobility plan. Um, and there is an even longer list that I can create basically or based on, on all these things. I don't see any activity in the, in the chat. So yes, I do now. Thanks, uh, Hassam. 
Um, so, and I assume many of you or your colleagues have done quite some of these plans. And even though they all have a different name, the core elements of them are almost identical. So every one of these plans that is done properly has at the beginning a vision development, a mission development together with many stakeholders that are involved in these kind of activities. So a multi-stakeholder collaboration and engagement. So you identify the most important people that should be involved in this um, in uh, many um, uh, European countries and southern European countries that's next to the city municipality itself. It's the arm length company that handles the public transportation that might be the uh, local university because they bring ideas, they bring innovation in this that might be the large employers that, you know, cause lots of the um, uh, con congestion in the peak hours. So you bring the most important people together to actually talk about it. Also, citizens are part of these groups, and you, will, you would define specific elements on how to engage them. So that is, so to say, a, one of the core elements. And that is also something that makes it both time and cost extensive. So it costs more time and money if you do this. And now, you know, if you look at the short-term budget, you might think, okay, that's not worth it. It's, you know, we do... So, one or two small workshops, we in include the people there, we inform them a little bit, and that might work. But in the, uh, if there is a stress on the plan, so for example, costs run out, uh, out of boundaries, or the, um, uh, you, you take more time than you promised in the implementation of some of these things later, then it's better to have all the players on board. And also if it works well, it's often the case because you know, um, the people of the different uh, institutions work well together across institutions. So with this engagement that, you know, can take anywhere between half a year and two years, um, you, can, um, you can just plan and prepare yourself, make yourself, and let's use the word, more resilient to out outside shocks for, um, uh, for years to come. You build trust with this exercise as well. So that's the first element that any one of these kinds of uh, plans has and should have as well. Then the second part is a clear structure. So um, pro pretty much all of the ones I have, uh, I have seen follow one of them. We'll go into the one for sumps um, in, in just a few minutes. Has, you know, there is a part um, where you show the mission and the vision. So why are you doing it? What are you trying to achieve? Then you go into an analysis part. Um, showing, you know, this is uh, this is where we are and this is where we want to go. So you do a data crunching um, in, in that element. Then you see what are the general working streams. And then you identify and you write down what are actually the activities that you're planning to do in what timeline and how to do it. And that leads basically to what is the last part of, of such a plan is actually um, the plan that is written down, a roadmap. You could call it many ways, but it's basically the activities that are then going to be um, implemented and those put on a timeline. So those three elements you will find in any kind uh, of, um, of these plans, also in sustainable urban mobility plans, and we'll look into that structure in just a few minutes. Now, one side note before I jump into, what, into the word resilient a little closer. A lot of these plans are now set to be a precondition in future funding. There is, for those of you based in the EU, there is a lot of EU funding coming up in all these uh, areas. And having these kinds of plans might be an eligibility criterion for specific funding sources. There is also, and I'm much more familiar with the European side, so I'm not familiar with each of the Northern uh, African um, um, and Arabic countries when it comes to public funding there. But especially with the Northern African uh, countries, there's a specific uh, um, budget that the EU has set aside for collaboration between um, uh, Europe and Northern Africa. And also these, it's very beneficial to have a plan like this because it's much more likely you get some additional funding. There is like this um, twinning uh, city um, 
funding uh, from for Northern Africa and uh, and Europe. Basically, exactly your region at the moment open for a few more weeks, and these elements are seen very favorable when it comes to actually getting um, funding from the EU side, from institutions such as the World Bank, the European Investment Bank, um, or other development banks from any countries um, across the world. So that's just as a little bit of a side note when it comes to funding. Now let's quickly talk about the world resilient and never be worried about these kind of terms, right? So there is, um, there is resilience, there is smartness, there is future, there is green. All of them have a little bit of a different meaning and a little bit of a different connotation to it. But in general, they all handle, let us improve the topic, in our case, uh, mobility. Resilient also always has this kind of element that it's more resilient to shocks uh, so that, you know, we it can withstand um, external shocks better um, than, um, than it used to be before. So that, you know, with the uh, pandemic would have meant and Miguel has some numbers um, on this uh, in, in our last few few slides, you know, good planning um, reduces the risk um, of uh, natural disasters and man-made disasters such as um, um, uh, pandemics. And sorry, that was wrong. It doesn't reduce the risk. It reduces the impact because the system can absorb more of these uh, unfavorable impacts. Basically, what you do with this is you prepare um, uh, with scenario analysis. You look what can go wrong and uh, how you can uh, act. You create plans how you can react uh, when specific things happen. Uh, um, a major road artery is uh, in shock because there is a large accident. What can then be done? These kinds of things, you know, the resilience approach um, uh, handles. So that's um, maybe a bit uh, on the topic of the resilience. And now let's look into a little more detail on how a uh, um, sustainable urban mobility plan is actually structured. So as I um, told you already, the, there is the several, um, uh, several steps that's actually part of the, of the plan. There is the preparation and the analysis. In a good plan, you do that with the right stakeholders. There is the development of the strategy, the green part here. Um, and then there is uh, the part of actually creating the measures, the implementation projects, um, and then putting them in a roadmap. And then, of course, implementing them. You see a lot of other elements and in more detail. And if we go a slide further, um, you see even uh, more details um, across. I don't see it favorable to go into all those um, details in uh, individually, but let me single um, one uh, or two um, out for you, especially when you do the analysis part. Uh, so, which is number uh, number three here, um, for example, and you create a KPI framework, so key performance um, uh, indicators. Um, and um, these key performance uh, indicators you know, you should be able to measure them later. So you would see based on the vision, based on the mission that you have, it's like how, with what numbers can we measure if we achieve that mission and vision. So that's part of the analysis to see where we are and where we want to go. And then you can measure at the later stage um, while you're doing the implementation, you can make sure that as part of the monitoring of these implementations, these figures get created. So a lot of these steps are interconnected. So good planning of a planning framework of basically a KPI, a, a monitoring system at the beginning helps you basically monitor um, the progress of, uh, of your mission, of your vision throughout um, the process. So that just as a singled out um, element uh, of, uh, of sustainable urban mobility plans. But again, uh, it always follows analysis, strategy development, the implementation measures, putting them in a roadmap, and then implementing them. And just that you, and we brought you two examples um, on, on this, um, how these uh, look like, and also some key figures so that you understand what different kind of sizes these can um, uh, also uh, be. 
So that, this is the one from Bologna in Italy. Um, 370,000 um, inhabitants in the city itself and about 1 million in the metropolitan area. And just that you know, so this sustainable mobility plan there costed about 150,000 euros. So that you also have a ballpark figure um, in the mind. So I've, ha I've heard, oh, a bit slower again, I'm sorry um, uh, for this. This one costed about 150,000 euros. Um, I have heard several figures depending on the sizes and depending also on the depth of analysis and the detail of the plan of between 40,000 and 300,000 euro when it comes to creating such plans. It's a rather wide range, but just to tell you that the 150,000 is the middle, but it doesn't have to be the one your city might have to pay for this. Also, you can do, it depends on how much you're doing yourself and how much you're giving out um, to externals. Why is that one a very interesting one? Because it's not just for the city itself, but it was created with the city and a lot of the smaller municipalities around it. So 55 municipalities actually were part of the development of the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan for Bologna. Overall, this process has involved over 7,000 um, uh, people, um, good half of which were citizens, um, um, and then the others, different kinds of, um, uh, let's say, um, stakeholders, unions, the municipal employees, um, and, um, and the different councils, um, for example. So it was an extensive and I think a very well planned and done um, um, sustainable urban mobility plan. I think this one is also available freely on the web. So if you want to have a look into a good example, um, uh, of a sustainable urban mobility plan. That is one that is not uh, very technical. Uh, so it always depends, you know, on let's say the status of a city and the focus of the political um, um, class as well. If it's it's very based on technology or if it's rather um, uh, non-technological. This is an example for a non-technology um, uh, ones. So this just have a look. Uh, into this one, it's a it's a good uh, example for a sustainable uh, mobility plan. Then we go to the second example um, that we brought, and that's a Greek example from Thessaloniki. Um, and there you can um, see also when it comes to the cost that the majority of the money, so there that one costed about 120, similar sized city, a um, little cheaper. Lots there was done also within the municipality. Um, that you can see the main cost um, here is uh, was the modeling. No? So um, modeling the um, you know status and the impact of different um, uh, of different activities. And this one is much more focused on also technological solutions. So big data, ITS, the abbreviation stands for intelligent transport systems. So um, uh, handling traffic. Um, based on uh, based on data, sometimes real time, sometimes um, based on scheduling. And what is a good example of this one here is that it was done in collaboration with the uh, the local um, uh, research institution. So it's always good, and in that particular case, it's especially strong that the knowledge of all these activities of you know the planning stays local. So, um, uh, of course, bring in international expertise. You know, that's also what, what we are doing as a, um, as a company. But to, it's important to also keep the learnings that are done during the process of writing the document because the final document is, is ju just parts of the results. The important thing is also the new insights that the people that were part of this process gathered. So they are an important resource when it comes to then implementing um, the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan. And for this, um, uh, this is a good example. Use the local um, research institution, at least for parts of the work, then the uh, information that the, you know, let's say the learning stay, and they can then also be uh, used for, um, uh, for future um, implementations. And that is now what we want to do next with you is into lo looking into two 
in particular, and I'm very happy that those were the ones that you also mentioned most often in um, uh, in the uh, in the beginning when it comes to your needs. Um, we want to look into two particular um, solutions. One um, uh, being um, uh, public bike sharing systems, and one um, being parking management. So uh, let us um, maybe uh, start with, uh, here we go. Let us start with the bike sharing um, uh, system. We have uh, some examples for this um, also uh, with us. So what is bike sharing actually? Same as with car sharing, with scooter sharing, um, and, and these kinds of things. Bike sharing uh, provide bikes that are not owned by the user, but are owned by an intermediary, either by the city or by uh, uh, other, um, uh, other partners, and operated by them, maintained by them, and are provided uh, to, to the citizens or to a particular group uh, to be used there, so-called mobility as a service. Um, there are different versions um, of these systems. There are the so-called free-floating ones where a car can be picked up and um, dropped off at any location. That most mostly across the world hasn't worked so super well. So the most ones used in cities we work with and also I think most feasible for most of your cities is the so-called station-bound ones. We'll have three examples of those later on, but this is basically where the bikes can be picked up and dropped off at specific locations. Um, some cities, for example, also Munich has a mixed version um, of those. Well, what do they do? They basically provide an additional uh, option for um, non-motorized traffic. Um, they promote sustainable transportation. It's an active mode of transport. So the motor is basically the muscle power um, of, the of the user. They reduce, therefore, also um, uh, the carbon footprint and have all uh, lots of the exam uh, lots of the benefits we mentioned earlier around health um, benefits. They don't use that much public space. They are less. They are a very uh, soft transport mode. So there is also less. Um, um, high injury accidents with them. So there's a lots of benefits from using bikes um, in these um, activities. These bikes can also be um, electric. Huh? So um, for those of you that have a rather, let's say, hilly um, uh, structure like we are used to here in, uh, in Stuttgart, uh, the electrification of such bikes uh, can help uh, put up the usage because then it helps the users also um, climb a hill, especially when it's hot um, outside. They are a little bit more expensive, but also um, efficient um, to manage with battery swap packages, um, for example. But they have also this kind of, you know, uh, element um, that, you know, people want to try and use them. They also give this kind of innovative um, feeling um, to it. Now we want to show you a slide. And again, we will not go into detail of this, but you can look at those uh, in all the detail you want um, in uh, on our webpage. This is available uh, for free in our solution um, uh, section alongside with uh, 30 other um, uh, of this is basically how does this solution look like in, in practice? So who is all involved? So in a simplified role-based manner, there are five different groups involved in the creation and operation um, of such a um, uh, of such a system. That can still be, you know, less than five um, entities in the end, um, but it can also be more because there might be several entities being in, uh, in, involved. So there's, of course, the city. Uh, um, uh, the city aims uh, to preserve orderly traffic, um, to maybe reduce uh, accidents, um, to improve um, you know, traffic flows, degrees, pollution. So that's why a city um, would invest uh, in, in these uh, kinds of things. There were also, um, we have seen that in Asia, there were elements where, you know, the city decided to provide this even for free because the benefits so far outweigh the costs that they say it's okay um, for using these things 
um, for free for a bit of time. And from the examples we'll have um, on the next slide, you'll also see that they are all uh, considerably cheaper than many other options. Then there is an operator that basically takes care of the operation of the bikes, makes sure um, that they are available, maintains them. The customer, um, of course, interested um, uh, in the availability of the bikes, the comfort of them. Then, and this is an important um, part with shared bikes, you always need to know where they are. You need to allow people to use them. So you need an access management system. Um, so there is an, a platform needed in the end to manage these kinds of things. And um, it's always good if these elements are, you know, um, included in a wider plan because this has influence on um, um, on the use of other uh, parts of um, uh, transportation. So for example, uh, with the use of bikes and scooters in in European cities, we have seen that actually it's not the, the, the users are not jumping from cars to these um, uh, elements, uh, to this new uh, options, but rather from public transport or walking to this new options. So that, that's just something why we have to plan this in, uh, in enough um, uh, details. So um, I'm not going to go through the exact, you know, built up of this. If you're interested in that particular solution, you can have a, um, a look. Um, but um, the, um, that might be interesting for you to tackle and we have best practices to look into and we will talk about them as the, um, you know, other pain points. They have been, um, um, you know, looked into on many different angles and we'll do some examples on um, this now with the examples that you can hear now on the screen. Um, there it, the first one is actually um, from Barcelona. It has several um, ways of pronouncing it, I've heard. So there's a Catalan way of it. I will uh, hopefully pronounce it correctly when calling it Bicing. Um, a very interesting and a huge success um, story across um, Barcelona. Um, uh, but also some elements that you need um, to know about this. So um, this um, is a station-bound system, um, you know, basically done by Barcelona City Council and a subsidiary of a large infrastructure company um, called Ferrovial. Um, and these bikes are available for a cheap price. I think it's like 25 euro to 30 euro per year. Um, but you need to be a resident in um, Barcelona to be able to use them. So there was a deal made between you know, the city council, the user, and between uh, other bike operators, especially the touristic ones, um, that you um, can only use them if you, have, if you are based in and around Catalonia. So that is a particular case. So this is really um, uh, you know, made and designed to be for um, public transport, um, for the daily um, journey to work, um, and not for tourists to use. So by the pricing, by the also, let's say, um, administrative barriers that were put in place for these kinds of things, um, this is uh, put in place as, um, uh, as really a you know, solution for the locals. It, is, it costs about, if, if I'm correct, about two and a half million uh, euro a year to maintain. Most of that um, comes out of, um, um, you know, parking tickets, parking fees that are collected throughout the city. And I think it costs about 30 euro per user per year um, to use them. So that's Bicing, a good, very good example of um, shared um, um, bicycles in Barcelona station bound and to be used mostly for the um, thing. And the others you know, have some differences. So I'll mostly um, uh, talk about that. So the, starting in uh, Lyon in France, there was uh, Velo, Velo V. It's uh, also kind of a similar setup where um, uh, the city um, um, and with a larger company, in that case, JC Deco together, uh, implemented um, uh, this kind of um, uh, system, also a very uh, good example, and you can read details 
um, about this also in the further reading. Then another example of uh, station-bound um, uh, sharing is um, bike, um, bike Me. Uh, it's in Milano. Uh, um, another uh, similar um, setup also available uh, for, for a cheap price, I think even for 25 uh, euro um, per year. They have a different pricing scheme, so it can also be used by um, uh, tourists. Um, so um, uh, diff similar, very similar system when it comes to um, the setup, um, but uh, very different when it comes to the pricing and actually what kind of users um, they attract. Another station bound one and this one in Milano. And then, um, well, let's say an example that runs differently and that you might have heard of also in the news, if not from Jump itself, but from other similar ones, providers um, from uh, also uh, Asia um, with the free floating model, which basically, if you want to say it nastily, dumps bicycles in cities and then allows private um, users to use them via an app. Jump is something was owned by Uber um, and with a deal uh, with the electric um, uh, scooter um, provider Lime is now under the management of Lime, um, which provides electric uh, scooters. Um, there has been lots of problems when it comes to safety. There have even been cities that have um, banned such services from their inner cities, also partly with very interesting um, uh, regulations. So an example from Amsterdam is that Amsterdam uh, told all the um, use, all the providers of such free-floating uh, cycling services they have to stop because they don't have a license to, um, to sell services in the public space because they wanted them out, basically. Uh, so these, the ones that come in um, without the support of the public, uh, of the city in that part, and that just provided as a sole um, private service directly from the company to the citizens. The problem there is that cities have very little, um, let's say, ability to change and work um, with these providers because there is no, let's say, connection point with that. Um, these companies have learned, um, but just that you know that just these kind of, you know, sit systems that don't involve the city of, at all also have the issue um, of, uh, of governance, of bad governance. That's an element there. So that's just some examples of bike sharing um, uh, systems. Then we said we're going to go into a second um, example, which is about uh, smart parking. Um, uh, parking is, a, you know, there's general numbers that about 30% of traffic is induced by, um, by parking. Um, you know, depending on, uh, on the city, you could spend um, anywhere between five to 20 minutes uh, looking for a parking space. I assume in many of your municipalities with the narrow roads, um, uh, also uh, people parking illegally, blocking roads, searching for ever for parking spaces is a huge um, uh, issue. Um, and that is basically, uh, smart parking is basically an information service. So what it does, um, it provides information that the driver doesn't have on where parking spaces are available and potentially guides this person um, uh, to these parking spots. Um, and that is, um, you know, um, reduces the, the amount of time that people spend looking for parking. It reduces stress. It also reduces traffic congestion and therefore uh, improves uh, the uh, uh, air quality. Um, and all you need for that is having the opportunity um, to um, have these information. And this is one of the um, systems that then uses um, sensors, so automated sensors, to uh, provide these kinds of um, information to the users via apps um, or via web services. And that has significant impact uh, on the improvement of um, uh, services there. So I think this is also rather um, straightforward uh, when it comes to um, 
to how that operates. So there are parking spots, each, either individually or several parking spots in, a, um, in, um, in some are equipped with sensors so that an, a system knows is the parking spot available or is it not. This, is, this information is given to an operator of an app or to um, an operator of a website. And this is, can then be looked into by um, a customer. There are many kinds of sensors available for, for these things. There are the overhead ones um, that are most often used in um, parking garages. There are the ones that are included in the surface of the road. There are some that use different wavelengths. Um, there are um, also cameras that are being used for that. Cameras can then also be used for traffic monitoring. So there is different ways of, of doing um, this and depending on what your other usages or what other kind of solutions you want to implement, you as a city can choose um, these kinds of um, uh, operators and, or the kind of sensors. And then from there, it's rather simple. We also brought an example on how this could look like, um, a very uh, simple but very good example from a, from a Greek um, uh, municipality. Um, where basically you can uh, see here all parking slots. So they have this for on-street parking and for off-street parking. So in parking garages um, where you can basically see on an app. So that's the picture on the very right um, where, um, uh, where parking spots are available and then be guided to that parking spots. Why we chose this example is particularly because it's not very common that on-street parking is being equipped. So there is a lots of, you know, providers of parking garages that have this available now. You know, you can see the availability on the signs at the front, you know, out of 400 parking spaces, 240 are still available. Some then in the parking garages have these green lights where you see is there a car parked or not. But having this for on-street parking is something very particular, not something very that you see very often. But of course, as you all know, on-street parking is amazingly important, especially for shops um, and for areas with a slow number of car parks. So this information can be collected as well. And I have to admit, I'm rather amazed by this kind of system. So that now as, Alex, yes. Can I interrupt you one second? I just want to remind people that if they have any questions, uh, they can raise your hand, their hand at any time or write it in the chat and we will, we will interrupt you to, to make such questions. Happily. It's so I, I also at any time have the chat here up and running. So I'll, I'll look into... Um, uh, yeah, no, for now there is no questions, but, <laughs> but just to remind people. So Thank but you. really, please feel free. And we, also, we will have time for a Q&A um, uh, at the end, about 20 minutes, I would say. Um, we have um, uh, four questions and answers at the end. But those just as two um, examples um, for sustainable urban mobility solutions. And also, fortunately for me, those that you have mentioned at the beginning as being the most interesting ones. Now. Um, what we want to do is uh, introduce you to do two good examples of, um, well, urban innovation projects in the area of mobility and also giving you some, you know, thought about how it costs, what, what are, you know, the considerations about this. So this is an, uh, another um, great example from, uh, from Thessaloniki where they basically changed the layout of a road um, and gave a whole part to bicycle and uh, another part to um, public transportation um, and um, therefore reduce the risk for the pedestrians. Um, and um, they really, you know, changed the layout. So what you can see on the picture, this physical barrier between the lanes is something that was uh, introduced, the coloring of the lane um, that was introduced, the, um, you know, pylons on the left and on the right so that um, cars um, that lose control cannot enter the, um, uh, the bicycle uh, road so that there is a physical barrier 
between uh, between the most motorized and non-motorized traffic. All these things were introduced for this uh, part of the city that costed, and this was a pilot project, so a six-month pilot project, that costed around 120,000 um, euro. And that's uh, um, uh, these uh, activities are rather, let's say, uh, common now, so that there is a the pilot period being used for um, um, for these kind of uh, um, activities, and then looked how it's uh, how it works, and then adopted um, in uh, in the future. When it specifically comes to you know improving bicycle and pedestrian uh, kind of usage, uh, so making people more active by walking and cycling. Um, physical barriers towards the motorized transport is something that has been, you know, found to be super important. So without, you know, you see that the um, color of the bike lanes and the color of the um, area for the buses uh, is different than that of the road. The coloring itself is important because it provides a visual barrier already, but the physical barriers provide real safety um, for, for the users, and that is the one where people, pedestrians, cyclists um, feel a lot more safe and that then also reduces uh, risks, reduces accidents significantly. Um, it costs space. So this is why often this is being done um, by uh, making roads that have been uh, both way roads into one way roads. Um, and uh, so this also increases the travel time for uh, cars and therefore um, gives another push towards using alternative modes of transport. Um, I'll have the French, uh, exactly, there is a French uh, question here. My my school French is unfortunately not good enough to... Yeah, um, uh, so they are asking if for electric bikes, if there are any subsidies and if the prices are affordable uh, in Europe. In Europe. Um, mm -hmm. So um there's two realities to that so um uh, people working in bicycle shops tell me that over 50 percent of bicycles now sold are already uh, with an electric motor so they are used extensively uh in uh in the uh, in the private domain already so more than half the bicycles sold um uh, at least in central europe are uh, electric they are more expensive um than um uh, than conventional bikes, a few hundred bucks, but there is um, also uh, the, the price had re has reduced significantly over the last two years. And there are su um, sub uh, subventions, um, subsidies, thank you, uh, subsidies um, uh, available depending on where you are. So we have seen cities actually that provide subsidies to, um, to people um, that use electric bikes. So it's um, here in Stuttgart, for example, the um, the city provides, um, I think, 2,000 euro of a subsidy for an electric cargo bike if the um, family then does not buy a car within the next two or three years. Um, so that's, so there is, um, these things are available um, and they are always you know, either national, regional, or city uh, level. So there is no subsidy that I am aware of on the uh, international European um, level, but um, a lot of pilot projects, and I would say, so I know of 10 of the top of my head um, that have been funded with European research grants um, to have the first activities up and running. And in a lots of your areas, I would say the Interreg funding um, or and other such uh, public funding opportunities can be used at least partly for these kinds of things. They're never for the commercial scale, but always for the first trials, these are available. We could also check, Miguel, if the, uh, if the EIB loans and grants apply for this not so, so um, thing because it's a, um, it's still a rather, let's say, um, a market where not so much capital is uh, is needed. So there is indeed uh, a market for that when it comes to subsidies. 
most likely when you prove that your investment is going to be used for decreasing your emissions in your city, increasing your renewable energy. So some small scale or large scale, large scale projects can be um, fundamented for such funds. Um, as Alexander just mentioned, the European Investment Bank has also programs for the North of Africa and the Mediterranean areas that can be used. However, some of them are loans or just partial co-funding for several for, for these type of projects. Okay. I hope that answers the question, Gemma. Should I move forward? Okay. Perfect. Um, then I would directly move into the second example and spend just a little bit of time on the example itself, but then give you a little bit of an overview as well, because data was also mentioned in, uh, in what is interesting to, um, um, uh, to you. So this is an uh, example of, um, well, um, uh, an event, uh, if, if you want, um, uh, the MotoGP. Um, it's a large event that happens in this area of Italy on a yearly basis, and a lot of people come um, uh, to visit. And you know, to be able to to plan this, to plan the crowd, uh, how it moves, when the people come, where they are coming from, to manage these kind of activities better, this city um, or this uh, event used. Um, uh, data from mobile phones uh, and this cost them about 10,000 uh, euro which is a very rare case where these numbers actually come into uh, uh, into public and this helped them basically plan um, all the activities better and um, so this is one example um, uh, of, an, uh, of an event for this and then I'll now show you all the different kinds of data that we um, have available for um, for planning either events or in general planning um, uh, our urban mobility system. That is a study, a study I've written now three or four years um, uh, ago. And these all these kinds of data are available worldwide. And as you know, mobility professional traffic engineers, the ones we are most used to are using survey data for, for long-term planning which is and is continuing to to um, uh, become to be an uh, a, a very important source for long-term planning but there is new ones that are um, available especially for us to manage traffic manage events such as the moto gp um, manage uh, interruptions such as if there is construction going on if there is um, an accident somewhere there are four different kinds of um, real-time data that can help us manage these kinds of things. There are traffic counting uh, things, you know, uh, could, could be loop detectors where, you know, a car passes through and then it's detected and then it's counted. Um, that could be also done um, with cameras, uh, but anything that is basically station bound at a location and counts what goes through. This provides already a lot of information um, about the um, um, about the status of traffic and is also the basis for what you mentioned also as an important point, ITS systems, so intelligent transportation systems. The um, live or at least scheduled management of traffic lights. So the simplest way of thinking about this is that um, if you have a, an intersection, and uh, lots of cars are going from north to south and very little um, are going from west to east, um, that um, you know, the north to south should have more green light than the west to east. And that system can learn this based on you know, the available data that, ah, okay, there are more cars coming and can put the green light and can adapt the scheduling of the green and red light. So that's the um, a simple way of using ITS and this to be really managed good well is the data it needs. Often these things are put into the, so these kinds of sensors um, are put into the ground um, um, 50 meters or, or, or so or on several locations before the intersection, which requires some groundwork. Now also um, sensors that are placed into um, lighting poles or on top of the um, uh, traffic lights uh, can also be used for these kinds of things. And that goes from, you know, simple 
you know, triggers to through scheduling, um, but then also to artificial intelligence that's actually learning how to manage the systems also between different intersections. So it's one thing to manage one intersection. It's another thing to manage um, how intersections collaborate, so to say. Um, and so the, these systems all need live data and most often use automatic traffic counts. Then there is two types of uh, more data that are available, um, floating car data, FCDs. Um, there are several uh, large providers of those, INRIX, um, uh, for example, ones. These are most often multinational companies that have access to, to data within the cars. So they can basically um, uh, have the location at any time and the speed of these, which gives you um, uh, information in a very high granularity of up to like say one, 2% of, uh, of the fleet uh, on how fast they are traveling. So if there are some cars with zero um, speed on a road, the likelihood that there is congestion is rather high. So these, these kinds of systems are also used to enhance um, you know, the management of larger roads um, in and around uh, cities. For example, the, the state of Baden-Württemberg, the southern German state of Baden-Württemberg, has bought a license for these um, data for the whole of Baden-Württemberg for every municipality to use. Then there is mobile GPS data, which is very similar, but it's the sensor is not in the car, but it's in mobile phones. So there is a lot um, more data available um, when it comes to um, uh, you know, the percentage of users that are using them. So we are talking way over 50% of people. Problem there is, of course, it's not that well available. So there is no standard packages that you can buy from companies like Google at the moment, but there are great um, pilot projects. For example, in the city of Milan, um, for using um, these kinds of um, data for, uh, for also traffic planning. And they're basically GPS exact, so in, up to a half a meter exact, and give you also some more information like acceleration and these kinds of, um, uh, of things. There's quite some privacy concerns around those and they are not really market available yet. So um, it's something potentially for the future. And one of the sources, and that is also the one that the um, uh, event in Italy took, are mobile network data. And those are often confused with the mobile GPS data. Um, mobile network data is, is a passive data set that's basically created when you move with a phone through a network of cell phone towers. So whenever you move, through a boundary, your phone sends a signal to the next tower and pings a signal back, and that signal is locked. And um, and so the the system basically knows that you are in this TV in this uh, area, but it doesn't know exactly where you are. But it has a coverage of almost a hundred percent of the uh, of the population because almost everyone has a mobile phone. Um, and that is for like say large movements of large crowds of people over you know, several kilometers or many, many kilometers, a very interesting source um, and especially gives uh, the opportunity also for cities to figure out um, uh, if they, where people come from. So for an event like this, you could figure out uh, where from the overall nation um, these, uh, these people um, uh, um, are used. I have a question here now um, on um, uh, if this uh, uh, mobile network data can be used for uh, transport models, especially for mode choice analysis. Yes, um, I would say you use them um, as one source in addition to survey data for, um, for the creation of origin destination matrices and then can use them as an input for, mo for mode choice analysis or for the mode choice uh, model. Um, there it, it's also possible for mid um, side or for mid length travel to identify which ones is, you know, if they are in a train, if they are in a car, if they are in a, if they are walking or cycling. Um, we have learned that in city centers, it's hard to identify if someone is moving very slow in traffic um, with a, with a bicycle, with a, car with a, I don't know, an overground train or something or walking. So 
um, the quality of that depends a little bit on the circumstances. But if it's a very clearly defined area where you can, with a high um, probability state, what um, um, or in what mode, depending on some parameter, you know, basically the the information you ha have is how fast is a specific point moving through um, uh, through cell phone uh, signals uh, through towers. And if that, you know, if that property is well distinguishable between the modes, then um, they, they, they can also be used for the analysis, not just for, um, so to say, the model creation. I hope that answers the question. Um, and they are very interesting uh, source and the big providers that are available are more and more making them available. So now I took a little longer. I'm very sorry um, uh, for this. Um, and now I'm going to hand over for the last few slides to my colleague Miguel again. Thank you, Alex. And um, well said about, about the, the information service. I will take you now for the last few slides, which is basically ending with a tone of why is urbanity long-term strategy mission important when we define our goal for resilience in our cities. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you have to un unmute yourself because I mute you. Uh, well, I mute Alex because I could hear you through Alex's microphone. So you have to okay. unmute yourself. And that's I'm it. here now. Is it? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, Gemma. Thank you. And apologies for. No, no worry for the hiccup as, as normal, it always happens something, right? So as we, we move towards the end, um, I was mentioned that we talk now about uh, resilience and the long-term urban mobility stretch definition. So why is such um, such parameters important? I will start with a, with a very good example that's, that was actually authored by us, which is related through the actual situation of the pandemic and the urban mobility strategies. So throughout the last six months, we have uh, surveyed a group of cities uh, from Europe, including Mediterranean cities. Fun fact, three of them from the metropolitan area of Barcelona. These cities, uh, not including these, well, including these ones, but also from countries as uh, Italy, Greece, um, Central Europe as Germany, the Nord Nordics, they share very common points, mainly that the cities during the pandemic of COVID-19 that had better planning and more def definitive and long-term plans with their possible projects for urban mobility were the ones less affected by the pandemic with the modes of transportation. So everyone in the end was indeed affected. However, the ones that had more clear strategy were able to fight back and make sure that the citizens were able to move around uh, depending on the situation, of course. Different countries have had severe um, problems. You can see from, from the graph that 70% uh, of, the, of the municipalities due to COVID-19 um, COVID uh, regarding their plans, they were positively or neutral influenced, meaning that COVID-19 did not stand a chance due to their long-term planning. In the report, uh, drawing some conclusions that I believe that they are very important to share with you is that besides these cities with, with the long-term plans uh, not being that much affected, is that cities that have innovation departments, that have people directly working with these projects that work cross silo, meaning that work with the different departments from the city, not only on the transport department, but work also with others, with the environment, with energy, um, with the citizens. So meaning that this cross silo collaboration and innovation made them stronger and made them tackle this type of uh, issues and challenges during pandemic, which can be all sorts of way in the end, it's a, it's a crisis. Uh, and they were able to tackle them and to be prosper even in these times. Of course, not as prosper as they, as they would like to be as no one was, but at least they, they, were, they managed it. Um, 
Our next example goes now to, to the city of Thessaloniki, which is another very good uh, strategy example, but in this case made by a city, not made by uh, a study of a group of cities. So this is not related directly to COVID-19, but it is related on how can long-term strategy and creating the mobility strategy within the city landscape will be important. So when you plan, it's crucial that you plan mobility within your city goals and mission. So if you are planning your mobility targets, your projects, you should integrate them with the energy, with the data, um, with public space, with everything that you're doing so that you can and you will be able to be successful with that. In this great example from Thessaloniki, one of the goals is to shape a thriving and sustainable city with mobility and city systems that serve its people. Therefore, they set seven objectives, very clear, clear objectives that they can use and they will use with a set of projects to move towards this long-term goal. As, an, as, as I mentioned, it's very important that these objectives are clear and that we set a path. Of course, in the course of 10 to 20 to 30 years, it is impossible that we reach to exactly what we wanted. But remember that planning is very important. Even though that you cannot do everything, you will always set a course and you will try to achieve it. Um, as we reach to the end uh, of, of the um, of the webinar today, uh, and we will be introducing the Q&A shortly. I saw that we have some representatives from the city of Izmir, uh, and we found rather curious their COVID-19 resilience action plan. Therefore, if there is, um, I saw the member in the, in the chat, I would invite them to, to share um, how they, they thought about integrating um, the transportation of, of um, the transportation and mobility in the resilience plan as one of the pillars. Uh, if if the the representative from the city would like to to give a bit of a talk and and give a few highlights from their city, I think it would be very interesting for the for the other participants. If not, we can open the floor for now for a discussion or other questions that you might have. I believe. Uh, it's, I believe the, the representative from the city um, is not able to give some contributions, so it's fine. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, I'm the representative of the Islam municipality. Right now I'm more than mob uh, on, on foot actually walking. Uh, sorry, it's uh, actually a quick, uh, how can I say, I'm not ready to represent uh, this plan because it's it's a collective work, so maybe in the next session I can make a brief uh, presentation about that. That uh, would be wonderful, Zainab. If, forgive me if I misspell your name. Uh, let me just congratulate no, you right. as well for the for the very good for the very good plan. And I think it would be very interesting if if you could share a couple of insights in the beginning of the next session. Indeed. Okay. Okay. I will. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for sharing also with us uh, the remark. You're welcome. Then, without further ado, we move to, to the last point, which is the question and answers. Um, some of the questions were already uh, answered by, by Alexander and myself during, the, during the, the session. However, now we still have um, 10 minutes, I, I believe 10 to 15 minutes to, to answer or discuss any topics that it might urge you at the moment or that you would have would like to, to talk about. So we'll give you a couple of, of minutes if you want to think about something. I would normally say not everyone at the same time, please so crowded <laughs> but but we we are happy to receive any type of questions and also if um, something comes up for uh, for next week so and we know that this was now close to two hours of input um, please feel free to bring your uh, questions next time uh, send them to Jama uh, throughout the week we 
collect them. We'll try to answer them also in written. Um, uh, if you um, uh, if you have um, points that come up during the next session, you know we're always happy um, to um, uh, to answer them. So, so as we approach the final remarks, I would like also to make one addition. Um, as you as you may know, the next session will start with uh, with challenges that the challenges the exercise of the challenges that we had. Um, a couple of, of minutes ago, minutes, one hour and a half ago, will be used as a first input for the next session regarding our best practices to share with you. Therefore, um, we invite you, if you'd like to share any specific challenges with your voice at the beginning of the session, you are more than welcome to do so. We will send you an information after this session regarding it. But it, for us, it's important that you also share with your voice and we are not presenting challenges that are yours with ours. We can and we'll certainly do most of them. However, we invite you, we invite you to share your, your challenges, your issues and what you really want to be solved so that you can share it with the community and ourselves can share better ways to, to solve them as well. And um, well, in case there is no um, other comments, we would uh, hand over back to, to Gemma from MedCities um, and appreciate on my behalf and behalf of Alexander uh, very much this time with you. Um, there is actually one question. Uh -huh. there is uh, so they are asking, what is the perspective to open data when we talk about uh, the transport data generated by the actors involved? Service Operator Mobility Observatory PA. Um, so um, there is um, several ways of of how you um, uh, can tackle this. So if if you look across um, uh, the let's say globe when it comes to open data, um, the ones from public service provision. So scheduling. If you have live data of where um, Buses or trams are, these are the ones that are most often given um, um, to the um, to open data platforms with APIs in real time for, um, for usage or for creation of apps. And they're also the most successful in the sense of the most used ones. I think there was a time in London where there were about 80 different uh, public transportation apps based on, on those kinds of data. So um, if, you, um, if you ask about the our um, view on this, um, it's definitely an important and you know, there is no, you don't lose anything um, as an as an operator uh, on these kinds of things. Of course, if it's an external operator, it needs to be in the contract um, uh, or need renegotiated, but that's often the case. Um, uh, in general, um, when it comes to, you know, tendering out service, giving to third party operators, the day ownership kind of issue is, is something that came up in, I would say, the last decade rather immensely, um, that you make sure as a municipality that you have access and depending on your uh, regional regulations, also maybe ownership uh, uh, of the data that you can use them for planning purposes, for providing additional services to, uh, to users, or which I think is a meaningful approach, providing them um, uh, freely um, on, on the web for then developers to use. I know, for example, many of you are from Tunisia. There are some great universities, um, applied uh, research institutions that have great students creating mobile applications. Um, this is, you know, for universities, for uh, uh, great source also um, for having coursework, for having um, uh, theses, practical work for the students to use this, creating this kind of public transportation information apps. Um, those are then, in many cases, also included in uh, in applications that provide live ticketing. Um, uh, but that is then with, uh, again something that you know the operator um, decides. But um, uh, so these things are, as they are also not privacy relevant because the to as a, as a municipality when it comes to um, when um, a bus, if a bus is late, if a bus is where a bus is um, uh, and when they are scheduled to come, um, you know, these are not privacy sensitive. 
um, because they don't tell you who is in a bus um, and these kinds of things. So they can, they are um, very easy and also very meaningful to to provide. I gave a lots of talk around this. I hope, did, did I get the question correctly and did I answer it? Okay, thanks. Elton. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we can leave this session here. So thank you all for coming. I hope to see you uh, all next week. Uh, thank you, Miguel and Alex, and thank you also for the, for the translators. So remember that next week the link is different. You have all the links in the agenda. Uh, so uh, see you next week. Thanks a lot for joining. See you next week, looking forward. Bye-bye. Likewise, thanks a lot and speak next week.